Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight. I hope everyone had a chance to pick up a bulletin on the way in. If not, there's still plenty of copies uh, back in the back for you. And I think, well, there's none up here in the front, so there's plenty of copies back in the back for you. Uh, a couple of announcements we'd like to highlight. Richard King is in St. Thomas Midtown. Um, he is scheduled to have surgery tomorrow afternoon. So I know uh, Miss Sue and Richard would like to be remembered in our prayers. Also continue to remember Janice Glasscock, Lee's mother, as she is having some health concerns. And also Bryant Rimmer, Cassie D's brother, is in need of our prayers. So as we go throughout this week, remember uh, those in our prayers. We do want to extend our sympathy to Lloyd Luker on the passing of his sister, Alice Vassay. Uh, her services will be held at a later date, but I know Lloyd would like to be, re be remembered in our prayers. Um, tonight begins our summer series. Uh, Drake Jenkins from Ashland City is here with us. I don't see him right now, but I know he's here. Um, I'm still looking for him. Um, there he is right there. He's sitting way back there in the back. So appreciate Drake being with us. Look forward to what uh, he has to say. Also, our summer youth series will be virtual again this week. We'll be at our house. Uh, drop off is at 6 o'clock. And then pick up is at 8.30. Uh, we are planning to provide dinner. So if you are planning to be, at, be there, if you would let us know just so we can make sure that we have enough food. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day you have blessed us with. We're thankful for the opportunities that, that you have presented to us to spread your gospel. We pray that we have taken advantage of each of those opportunities. We pray that you be with each one of us as we enter into this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. First song this evening will be number 532 and number 532. Praise him, praise him. I'll be leading the first verse of this song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our Lord. next song before our scripture reading and opening prayer will be number 299. Number 299, I Stand Amazed. I'll be leading all five verses of this song. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus
This evening's scripture reading will come from Luke chapter 14, verse 11. Again, that's Luke chapter 14, verse 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father in heaven, Lord, God on the most high, Lord, we, we come before you this evening, Lord, so thankful for the opportunity we have to come and worship you, to come and hear a portion of your word brought to us. Lord, we're so happy and excited to be here, and we thank you for allowing us to. Lord, we pray that um, you be with this country tonight, Lord, with all of the all of the things that are going on in it. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to our country, bring understanding to our country. Lord, help each and every one of us to love each and every member of this world like you would have us to, and as you have loved us, Lord. Lord, um, we just pray that you would help this world to, to see the wisdom that is in your word, to help them see the wisdom there is in loving. Lord, help, help every person in this world to see that and to turn to that and to embrace that, Lord. Lord, um, we just pray that as we go throughout the rest of the service and throughout the rest of our lives, Lord, that we would um, conduct ourselves in a, in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, please help us to strive daily to continue to grow and to grow closer to you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you again for all that you do for us. We pray that you would be with us throughout the rest of the service. For all this in your son's name, amen. Our invitation song will be number 23, All Things Are Ready. Number 23, All Things Are Ready. But before that, let's sing number 867. Number 867. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And that's number 867. I'll be singing this song um, twice through. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord.
Let me walk the mile up this road here. Okay, it is good to be with you. Thank you for having uh, us here tonight. And um, thank you for being here. It's still uh, odd uh, to get, and I'm, I'm loud. Am I loud? Am I hearing? I'm, I'm hearing myself. It sounds good. Anyway, all right, so um, it's good to be with you. Uh, I, I am not used to being in an auditorium. I was telling Andy this is the first time that I preached in an auditorium in 14 weeks, and at AC we are still not doing uh, what y'all seem to be doing, and so that's great, and it is nice. We have had services in our gym, and we all wore masks, and so I kept mine on for a couple of minutes but nonetheless, it is good to be with you, and certainly uh, love getting to come out here. Uh, I was telling someone in the bathroom, which is certainly an odd way to start a sentence, but anyway, uh, I was telling someone in the bathroom that y'all have the nicest Chick-fil-A in the world. All right, so I, I'm not convinced that's what it is, but it certainly said it on the outside. But it's nice to uh, see some people that I know and that I love. Uh, certainly thankful to Andy and his leadership and his love love and um, glad to get to be a part of this and uh, I think a part of a youth uh, thing that we'll do later on in the summer. But it's good to be uh, here uh, tonight and I hope, I hope that when you're in this place that you believe in the blessing of being in this place. I think that sometimes church to a lot of people is just something that you do or it's somewhere that you go that we don't necessarily take full advantage of what it truly means to be in the presence of God. Doesn't the Bible say where two or more gather there? I think the old Bible says there I'll be in the midst of thee, but I don't talk like that. I like to put it this way, when you show up, I show up. And so it's interesting that here we are in this place, and to some of you, this is just a random Wednesday night. But to God, well, this is important. This means everything to him. And that means this should mean everything to you. Now, I try to say this everywhere that I go and speak, and I've had opportunities, and I'm so thankful that I don't do well in the seriousness of what a church is. I've always struggled with that, with knowing my audience. At AC, we're laughers, okay, and uh, I don't know exactly how you are, but I would tell you it's okay to laugh if you think something's funny. It's okay to throw a songbook if I preach too long. You do whatever you see fit. But I do want you to experience goodness and excitement in the place of worship, and here's why. What I've gathered in three decades is... I see people in all arenas of their lives, in all arenas of whatever it may be, and it seems that they are least joyful in the place that brings the most joy. I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't like that. And so tonight I want you to enjoy being here. I want you to take part in the joy of getting to worship together, in the excitement of laughing and being together. And I will sort of begin with that. So my topic is a connection, which is really a, an, an interesting thing, a connection with God, and kind of a subtitle of, you know, connecting with God through humility, which is a really neat thing. I have a one-year-old little baby Sadie, and I have a, a three-and-a-half-year-old little Lakin Elizabeth. And when I came home from work today, I picked her up, and she was in her new Jasmine outfit. Now, we own every princess, uh, y'all. If you have, I have, we have all girls. Our house is pink, and it's crazy. And we now have a new puppy, and it also had to be a girl. I don't know what I'm doing. But anyway, we've got all girls, and I love it. So she got her new Jasmine outfit in, and she is a Jenkins, which means she doesn't mind uh, show and tell. So she walked in there, and she was prancing, and she had an audience, and she loved it. And she said, Daddy, what do you think about me? Now, she's three, keep that in mind. And I said, well, you are the most beautiful girl in the whole wide world. Now, I had to say it quiet enough because her mom and baby sister were pretty close in proximity. But nonetheless, you are the most beautiful girl in the whole wide world. And this is what my three-year-old said to me. Daddy, that's vain. And I thought, okay, I have my opener for tonight. Humility, connecting with God through something that most people don't understand or something that most people choose to ignore. 
Let me begin with this. Why in the world are you here? Why? I mean, have you ever asked yourself when you come into an arena, a worship service as it is, why in the world did I choose on this particular Wednesday night with everything going on around us, why am I here? And for some people, they never ask that question. Did you know that I'm convinced, based on some studies and based on some things that have my own perception, that it seems that a lot of people show up to church because of persuasive influence? And that's it. That I showed up to this particular religion in this particular town with this particular name on the sign because and only because persuasive influence. My granddad was the preacher, my uncle was a song leader, and my great-granddad built the building. And here we sit. But you don't necessarily pause to ask the question, why am I here? Some people think that church, well, they think that the most important part of it is probably a plethora of things. Some people believe that we have this call to church, and the most important thing in church is, you know, attendance, right? That there are individuals that perhaps if you were to answer the question, why am I here and what is the most important thing in my spiritual life, it would be my attendance. That everybody, if you grew up in the church at all, you have heard someone uh, partially quote Hebrews chapter 10, Do not make it a habit of what? Yeah, do not make it a habit of what? What's that next word? So y'all don't talk here. All right. Forsaking is the word. If you don't know it, open your Bible to Hebrews 10. Do not make it a habit of forsaking the gathering of God's people. And the rest of that obviously is left out, the part that speaks about edification and encouragement and building up. But nonetheless, some people, maybe even you here tonight, are present, and the most important thing in your life is your attendance. And you feel accomplished when you can check your box, making sure that the world knows that you have perfect attendance. Some of you in high school, the the goal was not valedictorian. Because maybe you knew yourself. I don't know. The goal was not salutatorian because maybe you thought that was out of reach. The goal was not to be the captain of some sports team. The goal was to get your perfect attendance award. Let me see by show of hands, how many of you had perfect attendance in high school? We're going to pray for everybody in this room, everybody. All right, my word. All right, so good. Maybe, maybe you don't care about attendance. <laughs> so some people do believe <laughs> that attendance is everything. And the reason I show up is, man, for my attendance. I've got, by the way, in church, my wife, when she teaches classes, when kids show up to class, you know what they get, don't you? A shiny star. Why? Because in the South, we love shiny things. That's why. And so they look at their name, and boom, there it is. And some people, that's why you're here, for your shiny, shiny star. Others of you believe that you show up, and the most important thing about church is money. Is money. It's just one of the money things. I don't know what they're doing. They're after our money. The preacher talks about money every five weeks. I don't understand that. They get up there and they speak about what it means, that it's not that the church is getting it, it's that God's getting it, and I don't know what that means. The reason, by the way, that preachers and leaders and, and individuals in the church speak about money is because it is an imperative, right? First Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it is an imperative. The Bible speaks about giving as you purpose in your heart. It's not just something we made up. Now, I, I find it intriguing that people live in the 10% rule. Uh, based on Colossians chapter uh, 2, 14 through 16. But nonetheless, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is very helpful. But I will say this, even in a, an area that is, is, does quite well, at least based on the houses that I saw and the Chick-fil-A and the McDonald's, incidentally, uh, that this is probably a pretty doing, you know, this is a hype area for money. But nonetheless, that's not why you're here. Do you know why you're here? Tonight. Do you know why you're here tonight? I know it wasn't to hear me preach. Y'all don't know me. 
I mean, my word, nobody in this room knows who I am. Most of you have never heard me speak, and most of you probably heard Ashland City and thought, oh no, he's going to come here in overalls. This is why you're here tonight, because the most important thing in your life, the, the thing that should shape your life, that should shape the decisions that you make, is being purposeful about daily growing closer and closer to Jesus Christ. That's why you better be here tonight, because you're purposeful. You have a longing within you that you want to grow closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Our greatest need, I would say, our greatest prayer is to be closer to him. Ephesians chapter 4 puts it like this, beginning in verse number 11. It says, And he himself gave some to be the apostles, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. And then he will go on to say, by the way, in verse 14, about continuing forward, if you please, a, a constant moving, right? We know First Peter's newborn babes desire the milk of the word so they may grow by it. But in this particular passage, it says that the reason that we exist is that you will no longer be as children, but you will put yourself in a position because of its importance to grow closer and closer and closer to God so that you can connect more and more and more with God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, 33, a passage I know everybody in this room could quote, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of who? God. Seek God first. Matthew chapter 6, the, the, the identity of connecting to something is seeking it first, putting it in your vision, going after it. If you seek me with all your heart, you are going to find me, God says. So we all have this opportunity to, to grow, to be something more, to connect. John wrote over in 3 John chapter 2, verse 4, he said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your souls prosper. Notice verse 4 of that same book. He says, I don't get any greater joy in life then when I hear people are connecting or growing, advancing, when I hear that children are learning more so to walk in the truth, isn't it intriguing, ladies and gentlemen, that in Matthew chapter 21, we read one of the most bizarre stories in all of the New Testament. I mean, when I was a kid and I read this, I, I decided I knew what exegesis was, and I took a hermeneutical approach to convince myself that God hated figs. Right? If you're not with us, look at Matthew chapter 21, and you read this story where Jesus is around this fig tree, and he goes up on the tree, and guess what it's not doing? It's job. And God does not like when he puts something here to negate responsibility. And so Jesus looks at this tree, and the Bible says that he cursed at the plant. That is not that he cussed, if you please, but that he put this sort of cursing on it, that it would not grow anymore. And you think, what in the world does that mean? Does that mean, at least from my interpretation as a child, that Jesus Christ hated figs? Well, if you ever had them, that's an easy interpretation. Does that mean that Jesus was not a fan of fig newtons? Absolutely not. This is what it means. When God made something, he expects it to grow. And when God made you, he expected you to grow, to learn how to connect to him, to learn how to connect with his people, to learn his attributes, to learn his characteristics, to learn the things that he loves so that we can love them, to avoid and flee and stay away from the things that he hates because we want to hate the things that he hates. I, um, I don't know that this is appropriate, so I will be somewhat subtle. While historically speaking, we are not living in the darkest of days. If you believe that we are currently living in the darkest of days, get on Google, read a book, 
go back to fourth grade history class. Spend some time with the ancient Near East. Spend some time with the rulers of the southern and northern kingdoms and look at these 40 individuals and how seven of them were righteous and the others were just a flop. But what I believe, and I think we would agree with this, without being political, without taking a stand in one way or another, is that the change that we need in our world right now is for people to be more purposeful daily and dedicated to growing closer and closer to Jesus Christ. That's what makes all the difference. I don't think it's more policy. I don't think it's more legislation. I don't think it's, it's taking funding from one particular group of individuals and, and putting it for another group of individuals, taking funding from one organization and putting it into social organization and all of the things that you can read about if, if you so choose. I think the thing that it, past, present, and future that has always changed the world and everyone with it and everyone in it is a dedication of being purposefully and daily trying to connect so that we can become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. If you have an issue with people in this world, it can only mean, in terms of, of, of showing partiality, it can only mean that you are far from him. We need to be dedicated to a connection, to a longing, to a growing, that when God looks at us, he sees us trying to be like him. Spiritual growth is, one individual defines it as a process of growing each day with Jesus. A process. Some of you football fans in here, you hate Nick Saban. Did you know, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, did you know, Cody, that June 28th will mark 5,000 days since the Tennessee ball, Vols have beat the Crimson Tide? That's together we stand. No, okay, all right, good. There's this Growth, and Nick Saban talks about this process. It's, it's a daily process. It's something that you're purposeful with. It's something that you seek. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, that I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. The Bible says in Galatians, I want the image of Christ to be formed in you. I want this connection. I want to be a part of who he is. I want to be something more. In your life, ladies and gentlemen, the best thing that you can do to connect to God is to become more and more like his son, Jesus. And it's amazing what Jesus did in terms of that connection, connecting with us and connecting with him. And so tonight, while I don't really know your schedule, I want to give you just one point. I've got four, but I'm, I'm mindful. So let me give you just one thing that I want you to pull from tonight. In terms of how do I connect with God in humility? How do I, how do I get over myself so that I can get back to worshiping him? I would tell you, number one, you learn to surrender. You surrender. That everything about your life needs to be a surrendering to God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, he says, when I heard of your faith in him, of your faith, of your surrender. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 talks about how the outward man, man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, it talks about this, this renewing of our spirit mind, of daily surrendering so that we can become more and more and more like God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus would say, Bless are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is this surrendering. We sing that old song, I, I Surrender All. One of my favorite songs that we don't sing anymore at Ashland City. Maybe you sing it here. It's an old song, and it talks about these words, all of self and none of thee. 
less of self and more of thee, none of self and all of thee. If you want to connect to God, you've got to surrender your yourself. You've got to stop seeing yourself for something great. You know, pride, man, it's, it's the worst thing in the whole world. Did you know that the Bible says God hates it? Did you know that pride essentially is the base of all of our sins, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? That you can go back in the book of Genesis chapter 3 when sin enters into the world and guess what you find? Pride. That you can go to sibling rivalries where there is blood that is spilled and the, the purpose and the foundation of that death is because of pride. That there are people in churches and peoples in families that are not speaking to one another that are distant from each other, that are, are disconnected, and it's all because of pride. That there are husbands and wives that have been married for so many years, but they don't sleep in the same bed, they don't sleep in the same bedroom, and it's all because they don't remember what brought them to that place, but no one can stand up and say, I'm sorry, because of pride. I've been in churches, ladies and gentlemen, where family members... Uh, siblings or aunts and whatever family members are sitting on different sides of the church building front and back because they don't want to associate with each other but neither one of them is going to leave their home church I'm sure that doesn't happen here pride is that terrible monster that gets into our lives that begins to make us think that we're something that we're not. Pride is is the opposite of humility. Humility is when the King of kings and the Lord of lords steps out as that crown jewel of heaven and empties himself takes on the form of a servant. Humility is in one of the final conversations before this Messiah will die, he bends down and he takes a towel, a rag, and a bowl of water and he washes, he washes dirty old feet Humility is being like Christ. And I, I don't have a three-point plan of how to be more humble. This is what I'm going to give you. Stop being prideful. If you're polluted with pride, let this be the day that you stop being prideful. I mean, that's it. You make a decision to not do that thing that you know you don't need to do in your life. You make a decision to resist the devil so that he will flee from you. You make a decision, Matthew chapter 7, to ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find, knock in the door. God, I'm, I'm so tired of, of trying to run my life. I'm so tired of thinking that I'm more than I really am. I'm so tired of only treating you like a cosmic Santa Claus in the sky that I only knock on your door when I need you to give me something. Surrender. Understand that God is everything. That's why we speak about him in those poetic terms that he's omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent and omnibenevolent, that he is the greatest, that with with man all things are impossible, but with our God all things are possible, that it's not about us, it's about him. It's why we don't teach works salvation. It's why we tell people on a regular basis at Ashland City that everybody in that room is a sinner in need of a Savior, and because of that Savior, I have an opportunity one day to be in heaven. What a unique definition of humility. When Jesus left heaven and came here for all of us. I heard a, um, a story uh, recently, 
about a husband and wife that were not doing too hot. And you know that happens. I, um, I met with an individual yesterday that's struggling in, in his marriage. I, I, I still, I'm confused at how couples that have been married for 20 and 30 years come talk to a 31-year-old that's been married for a decade, but I'm humbled by it, I guess. But we were having this conversation, and he was telling me all of his wife's flaws, and she was not present. And I thought there's a lot of people that struggle in their marriages, aren't there? I wonder if there's a couple here even tonight, a couple that's watching on live, online with us tonight that's struggling in their marriage. There was a story of this couple that was struggling incidentally in their marriage. And one day this wife, this man came home, he picked up the kids from school, he came home and his wife was not there. Most of her clothes were out of the closet. Most of her things that she used to get ready with in the morning and some of the things that she used to decorate herself before she would go out to her job were mostly missing. And all sort of indicators and evidences pointed to the fact that she had left. She was gone. And so he called her and called her and called her and she did not answer. And so he sent her text messages and they were opened but there was no response and he sent her DMs and they were ignored and he sent her all of these social media ways that you can communicate with each other and he was ignored or left on read and all of these things that were just not happening and he could not figure out where in the world she was. So he called the police and they looked and they looked and they looked and after about three days, they had found her location about two miles from their residence in some old hotel. He got in the car and he put the kids in the car and they drove out to this hotel. When he walked into that place, he knocked on the door. He opened the door and there she was. He said, I want you to come home. She got her bag, turned around, went back inside, got her bag, got her belongings, got her clothes, got her jewelry, got all the, the stuff that does all the stuff, and put it in a bag and zipped it up and pulled out the handle and rolled on down to the way and put the bag in the van, sat in the passenger seat, buckled up, drove home, went back to the room, unloaded everything, and he sat there puzzled as he could be. I mean, what in the world? We've been reaching out to you for days and days and days through every means of communication possible and getting the law involved. And so you finally couldn't take it. And he walked into this room where his wife was unloading her suitcase. And he said, what in the world changed? Why, why all of a sudden are you back? And he, she looked at her husband and this is what she said. You ready for these words? You came. You came for me. And when I think about how do I define humility under the umbrella of connecting with God, you know what the answer is? He came. He came for me. He came for you. And he lived in this world where he was treated in such a way, we wouldn't treat dogs the way that they treated the Messiah. And he loved them anyway. And they misquoted him. And they lied about him. And he loved them anyway. And they put him in trials that would go against the Roman law. And they loved him. He loved them anyway. And they made him stand in different courts for different branches of government, being embarrassed and humiliated abundantly. And he loved them anyway. 
And they came to the place where no one could find fault in this wonderful, wonderful God incarnate, the anointed one, the crown jewel, the king of kings, whatever you want to call him, the son of man. And they only can listen not to logic. Logic, Socrates say, is the metaphysical and the epistemology and the axology of a com- compilation of bringing in this thought. And when you do that, logic is in front of you. Pilate saw the logic, but he ignored the logic. The crowds saw the logic, but they ignored the logic. They responded this way. Kill him. Let's just kill the guy. It'll be so cool to see that. Why in the world, when you turn on the news today, and you see people vandalizing and throwing bricks through perfectly good windows and shooting each other and running over each other with tractor trailers, are you shocked? He was perfect. He was tempted just like us, but he was perfect in every way. And their response to his perfection was kill him anyway. And they take him broken and beaten. And they take him down this road. You know this story, don't you? I mean, if you've been in church for 10 minutes, you know the story. And they walk him down this road. And do you know how much humility it must have taken God to not just stop everything? And by God, I'm referring to God, the Son, Jesus Christ, to not just say, I'm done. I mean, do you know how much you, what would you do? You know how much humility it must have taken when someone spits in your face to remain silent? Do you know how hard it is when someone speaks falsely about you to remain silent? If you think it's easy, then you're not on Facebook. I mean, that's our go-to, to defend our honor, going to social media, to break people down, going to social media, to be the most cowardly individuals we can possibly be by using social media as a platform, and literally they spit in his face and he did not say a word. That is humility. And he carried his cross to the place of the skull. And they put the nails in his hands and they lifted him up in all of his glory. And they put that tree in that hole and you hear a sickening thud and there he is and you know what you find out that it was humility and even joy that Jesus was able to endure in your life if you want to endure If you want longevity in spirituality, if you want spiritual growth and a connection to God to purposefully and daily become closer and closer and closer to him and his identity, it begins by swallowing Drake's pride and living in humility. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for this evening. Father, we we're thankful that while there is sin going on all around us, we're thankful that we're here with you, that we're here with each other. Red, yellow, black, and white, we're so thankful to be together in this place. God, we are so, so sorry when we don't connect with you. It's so easy. It's not hard to find you. 
you'd tell us exactly how to reach you. But God, our pride keeps us from connecting to you. And it's in this moment, Lord, that we, we vow to you to be humble. We're not going to be prideful. All of us in this place, we pray in this moment how sorry we are that we let pride get into our lives, rule us, push our agenda, poison our thoughts and convince us that we're really making a difference. And we replace it with humility. We vow to be on the process of growing in humility. And we are so, so thankful, Lord, that Jesus was the embodiment of humility. That he emptied himself so that one day we might be with you. We love you, and oh, we know you love us. In Jesus' name we all pray, and amen. If you're here tonight and we can help pray for you, I was told to offer an invitation. I think that means you can come up to the front if you need to do that. We can pray for you, and someone that leads in this place can pray for you. Maybe you're here tonight and you're ready to surrender yourself completely to God and you want to do that through baptism. You do know Mark 16 makes it clear you cannot go to heaven until you do that and we'd love to help you do that. If we can help maybe just wrap our arms around you and remind you that God chose you, we'll do anything we can as together we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the peace. Come Lord. So glad that each and every one of you could come here to worship with us at Southern Hills. We hope you can come back for our Sunday um, morning service. We have two services, Sunday um, morning at 9 a.m. and Sunday at 11 a.m. And as a reminder, remember that the 9 a.m. service is for those who, um, who are the highest risk for COVID-19. So those of you who do come for the 9 a.m. service, be sure to wear masks and be very careful with social distancing. Um, so we hope you can all come back for that. And um, as for the comment about the 5,000 days since Tennessee won a football game, I just want to say, roll, tide, roll. Now let's sing number 756. Number 756. When we all get to heaven, I'll be singing the first and fourth verse of this song. Sing the one verse of Jesus in his mercy and his grace. In
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for all of its many blessings. Father, as we depart to our homes tonight, we ask your special blessing upon all of us to help keep us safe from the virus. And we ask your special blessing upon this country during this time of unrest. Please forgive us of our sins and bring us back at the next appointed hour. In Christ's name, amen.